Good afternoon, everybody. I want to say thank you and welcome to uh, Brookings webinar that is going to be focused on the digital divide. Uh, my name is Dr. Nicole Turner Lee. I'm a fellow at the Brookings Institution Center for Technology Innovation. I'm very excited to have this conversation. For those of you that know me, this is an area that is near and dear to my heart, an area I've worked on for many years. Um, just a shameless plug, I'm working on a book around this called Digitally Invisible, How the Internet is Creating the New Underclass, which will actually be available through Brookings Press next year. And I'm just really excited that this is such a timely point to talk about the digital divide. I mean, let's be clear. As we look at what's happening during this very, very difficult time, we've got 52 million school-aged children that are at home. Uh, we've got a big chunk of America, about 20 million plus, according to the Federal Communications Commission, of people who are not connected. And as we look at how we are putting out mitigation strategies to ensure social distancing, to find the right vaccine, to communicate daily information on where we are with this global pandemic, being connected matters. And so the brunt of today is really to talk about, you know, what does that look like for the disconnected? In no way are we going to suggest today that there's no broadband connectivity that exists in the United States. We know that there's been tons of private investment in the infrastructure in which we are using to actually do this webinar. But the challenge that we have today is that the digital divide looks very much like other inequalities that we have not quite solved. So I'm very excited to be joined by two very special people who pay as a, much attention to this topic as myself, if not more. Uh, the first person that will be joined by is second term, Jessica Rosa Warso, the Honorable Commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission. If you follow her Twitter, you would see a moment by moment um, display of tweets trying to get our children back in school through remote learning and distance education. At the FCC, she's also been a huge advocate for the protection of the affordability of broadband when it comes to the Lifeline program. Her bio is available via the uh, setup for this webinar. And next to her, the other person that you will hear from is someone that I recently met who I just cannot say how much she actually impressed me uh, when I went out to Marion, Alabama. If you've had an opportunity to read my recent research, schools and communities and local digital divides around that, you would have read about a lady named uh, Dr. Kathy Trimble, who is the principal of Francis Marion School. In this town of Marion, Alabama, she runs a K-12 school where they actually have a one-to-one -one solution of technology. But I asked her to come today to share with us what they're actually doing to ensure that her kids in her district are getting online. And I think she's going to actually tell us some compelling information that often we in the Beltway don't hear. So that is our scope of our guests today, the scope of our conversation. I want to remind everybody that we are live streaming, but we ask that you send questions to events at brookings with an s dot edu or via twitter and using the hashtag at brookings gov or hashtag uh digital divide so again if you have questions we want to take them we reserve some time for questions please email them to events at brookings edu or send it to us on twitter to brookings gov or digital divide so with that i want to jump into this conversation because the only thing about this People like me who talk too much don't have enough time with a one hour <laughs> webinar. <laughs> and uh, so I want to make sure I get all of the conversation in. So Commissioner, I'm actually going to start with you because this is a conversation that you and I have had virtually. I want to talk about why during a global pandemic, we're actually having a conversation about this growing digital divide or inequalities that are surfacing because of the lack of connectivity for certain populations. Well, thank you, Nicole. That's such a good place to start. And also thank you and the Brookings Institution for having me today. So, I mean, look at what we're doing right here, right? right. I mean, it proves the point because as a nation, we are online like never before. We're headed online for work, for education, for healthcare. And that has consequences because not everyone in this country is connected. And so, in this pandemic, at this moment, we have got to use it to understand who's not online and how we're going to help them get there. 
So I feel like talking about this right now is critical, it's essential, it's how you start solving our nation's digital divide because it's always existed. But this pandemic is just revealing a hard truth. It's bigger than we thought it was and we gotta do some work to fix it. You know, and I want to go to another question for you, uh, Commissioner, while we're on this topic, because, you know, I've known you for over 20 years. I mean, I know we still oh my young, gosh. right? I know, right? But, you know, when I was working in the, as a digital evangelist, we were talking to you back then in a company I was with called One Economy. You know, you talk about this thing called the homework gap that actually was really a gap way 20 years ago when there was a disconnect between what kids could do at school and what they could do actually in their home or community. Can you share with the, uh, the audience, what do you mean by homework gap from your mouth so we can actually hear it? Because I think that's a nice segue into some of the challenges that we're seeing with regards to kids not being able to go back to school because of the lack of connectivity in certain communities. Sure. So the way I like to talk about this is I start with when I was growing up. To get my homework done, I needed paper, a pencil, and my brother leaving me alone. And you know, that third one was the hard one. But those days are gone. Kids today, no matter who they are or where they live, they need internet access. It's become an essential part of doing nightly schoolwork. We know that seven in 10 teachers assign homework that requires internet access, but all of the data from the Federal Communications Commission suggests that one third of our households don't have it. And where those numbers overlap is what I call the homework gap. The Senate Joint Economic Committee says there are 12 million kids in this country who fall into the homework gap. But you don't even need to see their data because in every state in this country, before this pandemic, you could have driven around and you would have seen them sitting at a fast food restaurant, nursing a soda while they wrote their papers. You would have seen them hanging out in the library or in the school parking lot to catch a free Wi-Fi signal. And the truth is, in the United States of America, we should be able to fix the homework gap. We should make sure that every child has the opportunity to do their homework. And this problem has been weighing on me and I've been crusading about it for some time, but here we are in this crisis. And as you said, more than 50 million children are now at home. Their schools are shuttered. And we are asking so many of them to head to class online. So it took this homework gap and it just made in bright, sharp relief how much work we have to do to get every child connected. Because we're gonna have to use this crisis to get policymakers at the local, state, and national level to focus on the homework gap so we don't leave any child offline going forward. You know, when you were speaking about that, I almost teared up because, you know, those battles have been persistent battles prior to COVID-19 that bet. I know many of us on this call have been trying to address. And here we are right now, you know, with this possibility of an educational meltdown, essentially, because mm -hmm. our kids are losing a lot of months of instruction. But I'm no educator. And Dr. Trimble, <laughs> I remember um, when I came to meet you, the first thing that you said before you spoke about the technology that you were giving your students in Murrin, Alabama, you were giving, you were telling me how they were sitting on stoops of your school mm -hmm. uh, over the weekend or parked in cars just to use the school's Wi-Fi. I'm gonna go a little bit into this further because that was what, six months ago when we were actually met? Mm -hmm. Now they can't even come outside because of social distancing. So Dr. Trimble, tell us a little bit more about what's actually happening in Marion, Alabama with, in response to this pandemic. Okay, cool. So uh, in the middle of March, we were under a preemptive dismissal for three weeks uh, because of the pandemic in an attempt to decrease the spread of the virus. So at that time, what we did was we devised an educational plan for those three weeks, our school did. Uh, we started scrambling around just like the, the healthcare professionals have to prepare for the pandemic on the healthcare uh, level. We had to do this on the educational level. It was a little bit different, but it was, it's just as hard. Uh, we did three weeks of work. The first week we decided the students would get uh, work for enrichment, which was also a time to do a trial run in the event that dismissal evolved into a, a closure as it, as it did, of course. The second week was gonna be our spring break week. And then the third week, the students were gonna be assigned actual required schoolwork. And then once again, we'll be able to see who actually had uh, internet access and that type of thing. Well, when the state superintendent came and declared school be closed for the remainder of the year, this placed us in the position of, as you said, remote learning. And our teachers were called in and spent an entire day trying to make contact with students and parents to see 
who had access to Wi-Fi or who had access to the internet. Well, when they did that, and, and as I said, it, it actually took about two days because some had both, some had Wi-Fi and not internet, some had neither, which let us know that remote learning was gonna be a, a challenge. And it is a challenge for us. With us having a disproportionately higher number of students not having access to the internet, it simply compounded a problem uh, we already face on a daily basis, a lack of resources. We have a limited number of textbooks. We don't have the resources to adequately supply textbooks for all of our students. So we're challenged, first of all, to seek equity in a situation where, in my opinion, equity could not be obtained. Uh, when we got the Apple Connected grant, it seemed to be uh, an answer to a lot of our problems. And that was good because we have the infrastructure within the school. We also partnered with AT&T, which did a grant to make sure that the students had access to internet outside of the school. But with the grant ending in uh, May of uh, this past year, now we no longer have that. We don't have that with AT&T. We're left with the devices, but we don't have the, the, the connectivity. So uh, what we're doing as a school, we're using a blended model for those without access to the internet are receiving hard copy packets of work to complete. And those with internet access are getting instruction via whatever digital platform their teachers are using. So like I said, we're sort of seeking equity where equity really does not exist. And while I have you, Dr. Trimble, and I'm going to pick up with you, Commissioner, on these devices without internet, right, in just a moment, but who are the people that live in Marion, Alabama, for those folks who haven't visited? I know it took me a long time after I left Birmingham to get to you. It was a two-lane uh, two road for at least two hours, and I was glad it was light outside, right, because uh, I had not really been to the South very often, right? Uh, but yes. who are the folks in your community when you talk about equity? What are their conditions, circumstances right now? Well, we'll talk about, first of all, we'll talk about the educational community that, that uh, we exist in at our school. 98% uh, of our students are on free and reduced lunch. Uh, the median income for um, Mary, or actually Perry County, is around $23,600. And that's down about $6,000 within the last five years. Uh, very rural area, um, not a whole lot of economic growth or development. So... And then right outside of the city limits, which is maybe about three or four miles right outside of where, of where our school is, uh, there's no internet access at all. Mm -hmm. So this actually ties to, and again, another piece that I just wrote on rural broadband gap, right here, just two hours away from uh, DC in Garrett County, Maryland. And all the pieces that I'm speaking of folks can be found on the Brookings web page um, under my name, Dr. Nicole Turner Lee or somewhere on our content. So Commissioner Roswell, I wanna turn back to you then, uh, this whole idea that Marion County actually has devices. And you know, we know that uh, programs change under different leadership. So for those of you that are unfamiliar, uh, the Connect Ed program was an initiative started by the Obama administration. Companies like Apple extended it way beyond the administration to provide those devices, but it essentially gave across the country through the various uh, private sector partners some type of one-to-one -one connection. Yeah. The challenge with schools is really the internet access in the community. So I don't want to get too technical, Commissioner, <laughs> but I do want to talk about the use of unlicensed Wi-Fi, for example. I know one of the things that I've been pushing is, you know, park a school bus, like you used to say, remember about five or six years ago, in the community to broadcast out unlicensed wireless uh, Wi-Fi so people could get online. I know the commission just opened up a six gigahertz um, proceeding on that. You know, what do you think about the use of that six gigahertz band for people with devices, but with no connectivity. Sure. Um, listen, when it comes to solving the homework gap, my solution is anything that works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that could work is something you mentioned, which is increasing the amount of Wi-Fi available. And so now I'm going to try not to get all spectrum nerdy on you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but here we go. Um, right now we have two bands that a lot of our nation's Wi-Fi activity takes place over five gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. And everyone who's got a wireless device or is working at home using a Wi-Fi router knows we're using more of those airwaves than ever before. And as we head to the internet of things, those airwaves are getting crowded. So what we need to do to make sure that Wi-Fi continues to be open and available and innovation can take place in wireless is make sure that more of our skies are opened for unlicensed airwaves or Wi-Fi. And the next big swath of spectrum that the Federal Communications Commission is looking to open is in the six gigahertz band. 
and it's very exciting. Here's why. It's adjacent to existing spectrum that's used for Wi-Fi, which means that devices could be available very fast. And because now we're gonna have a really big amount available in this mid-band spectrum, we're gonna see speeds that are near one giga, gigabit with the next Wi-Fi standard. So taking that back to why it really matters, which is how do we get more people access, is it means we could have more Wi-Fi in more places. And we know Wi-Fi democratizes internet access. And the more we can make it available at super low cost, the more students and individuals can get connected to life online. And we need to make that happen. So that's how you go from the technical and nerdy yeah. to something that I think is meaningful. Yeah, and Dr. Trimble, I think that would might be an answer to some of the concerns you have about getting those kids on who have some kind of connect device but may not have the connectivity. You know, I want to stay on you for just a moment, Commissioner, because, you know, we've gone through the first stimulus relief fund, you know, Senators Markey, Schatz, and others actually came together to try to promote the use of unused E-rate funds into the stimulus so we could actually connect people like Dr. Trimble and we connect schools in Washington, D.C. and all over the country that are actually having these same types of experiences. We're now in rumors that we're on the next relief uh, bill. And I think your colleague, uh, Commissioner Starks, put out something about a connectivity stimulus. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing around that? What conversation yeah. should we be having to sort of get the attention of policymakers who are doing a great job, right, in terms of uh, pushing out legislation, but to pay attention to this area? All right, well, I'll be very clear. I want the Federal Communications Commission to solve the homework gap. And I think we can do it with the authority we already have under the Telecommunications Act of 1996, and bonus if Congress steps forward and gives us additional funds to make that happen. And I remain hopeful that those things can happen. Here's how it would work. In the Telecommunications Act of 1996, and I don't know, remember 1996? Like I had an AOL account, it was a long time ago. <laughs> Congress was ahead of the curve though. They saw that they should make sure that every school in this country should be connected to the internet, that it was gonna be essential in the decades ahead for learning. They were right. And now, as a result of that law, the FCC runs a program called E-Rate. It's the nation's largest education technology program. It sends funds to schools and libraries in every state to help them get connected to really high speed broadband. But now we know the challenge is not at the school building, it's right. the students at home. And if that legislation was designed to support the classroom, well, guess what? The classroom is no longer that school building. It's the kitchen table. It's the student at home. So let's be creative with that authority and use it so every student can get connections. And we can do that with lots of things by helping support broadband at home or having schools use the E-rate program to loan out Wi-Fi hotspots. Yeah. Yep. And for every student, that could be the difference between keeping up in school and falling behind. And so let's use the E-Rate program to solve the homework gap. And let's not waste this crisis. Let's do it right now. Yeah, so Dr. Trimble, I mean, we sit in Washington, D.C., right? And we, we work through legislation and regulatory uh, policies to actually bring out to communities like yours. I mean, what's your familiarity with E-Rate? You know, is that something in terms of the ideas that you're hearing would be a stimulus for the people in Marion, in Marion, Alabama, and Perry County. Well, well, of course, I am, as as the commissioner said, I am familiar with E-rate and um, and how we utilize that within our within our school district. But I, I do want to add something there. Just last week, the state of Alabama had nine broadband providers receive receive a total of nine point five million dollars in grants to bring high speed internet access to Alabama communities. Governor Ivey awarded the grants under the Alabama Broadband Accessibility Fund, which was created by the Alabama legislator in 2018 to help rule in underserved areas. Now, of course, I was more than excited to see this until I read the article that listed the grants awarded and the coverage areas, and Perry County was not on the list. Mm. Now, that led me to inquire, why not? So after checking with one of our senators, I was informed that no one in our county, our city, our region applied for the grant. Hmm. So you asked me about our needs. We have so, so many needs. And, and, and the first thing, obviously, we need someone advocating for us. Uh, and not only to include the students at Francis Marion, 
but that includes all students throughout Perry County and all of its citizens. Do you think for one second, if I had known these grants were available, that I would not have made every effort to apply? Absolutely, I would have. It's one thing to reach out nationally. And uh, as we did, we got the Apple Connected grant. Uh, Apple spent millions of dollars, as you said, Nicole, to make sure all of our students not only had iPads, but they also had access to Apple Care 24 hours a day. It, it's, it's one thing to partner with AT&T. While when we had the Apple Connect Ed grant, who contributed $1.7 million over three years to provide mobile high-speed high internet, which made connectivity go beyond the classroom and the school, but students also had access at home and anywhere there's Wi-Fi, that's all great. But when we have our local and state personnel who seem to forget about us or forget the fact that there is a need to, for, for some sustainability in order for these students to continue to get the best usage out of these devices that they have. We need our people to advocate for our needs. Um, secondly, we, we currently do have the infrastructure within our school, thanks to Apple, where the students can utilize the device, but just like the commission that said, that's why they're at school. But when your school is the kitchen table, that's a whole different ball game. And then not only that, now these devices are four years old. And our students and our staff are, are trying effortlessly to, to complete tasks using outdated equipment. So each year we, we still go, I'll, I'll give you a really good example. We go to um, our Apple Leadership and Leading Academy to stay abreast of the latest tools and what our students can and should be doing. I'd be so pumped there. I, I learned so much. Our team brings so much back. Uh, one of the things this year uh, was, uh, that we brought back was Girls Who Code. And we started two Girls Who Code clubs at our school. We were so excited at the academy. I mean, we worked all night at the academy when everybody else was partying. We worked all night coming up with a plan. We got back to the school. We had an interest meeting. The girls were excited. We were pumped and we were ready to go, only to find that the devices basically were antiquated and we could not use them. So that left our teachers scrambling to see how can we make it work. So another issue for us is, is sustainability, like you spoke about earlier. How do, how do we keep these, one, not just having the one-to-one -one devices, but how do we have them where they're working to the maximum potential for our students. Yeah. No, and I think that's such an interesting way to look at it because I think your school district is not the only school district struggling with this right now. I mean, I think you would all agree that the same, the one part of this three-legged stool is affecting schools all over the country. They either have the device, they either have the access, or they have training, or they have none of, none of the above, right? And so to your point, I mean, the question I have for you is I want to go first down to the rural broadband challenge. And while we have the commissioner's ear, you know, have her listen to what you're saying. We see a lot of money allocated towards rural broadband in, in recent years and months, right? We just announced a huge rural broadband connectivity fund out of the FCC. But we're also seeing, I think, this, this extent to which could somehow be called broadband gentrification, right? Where you have poor communities that may not get access to that or may not have the knowledge. Commissioner, what do we need to do to ensure that we have a ubiquitous plan? Because I think what COVID is actually suggesting to us is, though these problems existed before, the disparities are becoming just more amplified. And I wanna put a shout out that there are tons of companies out there that are stepping up to the case to make sure that people have what they need. You know, this, uh, through the Keep America's Connected program, we're seeing a lot of, uh, Dr. Trim, but I could send you those resources of what companies are doing. But I wanna talk to this broader issue of blanketing the country with access, even when they are some of the poorest, most rural communities that we're dealing with. Commissioner, you yeah. wanna respond to that real quick? Sure, sure, listen. Um, yeah, just like you said, let's, um, let's give a round of applause for the companies that have stepped in with low cost and even free plans to help connect low income communities and individuals during this crisis, they deserve credit. But in the end, I don't think as a nation, we wanna just rely on their generosity. Right. We wanna have a program for justice. And I think digital age justice is getting everyone connected. And there are two things that I would focus on right now when it comes to that. The first is that the maps at the Federal Communications Commission describing where broadband is and is not in this country radically overstate service. That's because we assume if there's a single subscriber in a census block, then, there, then we assume that there's um, service available throughout. Mm -hmm. And that's just not right. Everyone knows from their own lived truth on the ground, there are so many places they don't get service. So if we don't fix those maps, 
we're not going to be able to manage this problem. You never can manage what you do not measure. So we got to start there because I think accurate data is the first thing and we are overcounting the state of service in rural America and that's a problem. We got to fix it. The second can thing I is I want to make sure that we don't just focus on deployment. So much of the vocabulary in Washington about broadband is where we're going to get the infrastructure, how we're going to get the infrastructure there. Let's also focus on adoption. We got a lot of communities in urban America where households do not actually have this service. We got to figure out how to get affordable and reliable broadband to all those households too, because it's not just kids who are in Marion, Alabama. It's that 60% of the students in Detroit are from households without broadband. They are suffering from the digital divide in the same way as some of our rural communities. We got to fix that too. So maps and then thinking about not just deployment, but also adoption. That's right. Dr. Trimble, you want to jump in? Yes, I'm sorry, Jessica, but, but I do want to add, um, and you're absolutely correct, because when, this, when the pandemic started, one of the first things that we noticed and parents are contacting us and saying, and the teachers are saying, oh wow, I'm providing service for you, uh, that you may be, the students be able to get internet. Well, it, those people are those service providers, there was, this area, they did not even service our area. So it was null and void for us. So, I mean, that was great. That was very generous, but it still wasn't an answer. And even if it was, it would only be a temporary answer. We're not looking for temporary handouts. We're looking for lifelong solutions. That's right. And I think, you know, again, I just wrote about this for uh, another rural community. I, I, I love the way that you all are feeding into my recent work. I have to tell you, this is a great time. Um, you know, part of what we're seeing is I think the blanket uh, solutions or wholesale solutions that we've come up with for policy when it comes to rural broadband may actually need to be shifted a little bit, right? We may need to look at, instead of divides, more solutions for what works for different communities. And we may have to think about ways that government can actually support the deployment of rural broadband, something that, you know, in the past we've shied away from. So Dr. Trimble, I think we're all on it here, just trying to figure out how to solve that because what we've learned about COVID-19, contrary to what a lot of people are hearing only in the news about the disproportionate effect of this disease on African-Americans, I got another blog coming out there on this with uh, colleagues from Brookings. The challenge is COVID had no color, it had no name, it had no income. And the people who are also being victimized by this, I think are a lot of the people we're talking about today who are disconnected, which actually leads me into another piece. And uh, Dr. Tripp, I'll start with you. What are the healthcare services like? I mean, there's a big push also for telehealth. Um, and I'm curious to see if rural communities, if you look at the blanket of rural communities like yours, will you be able to benefit from that? And then I'll pivot over to the commissioner who's actually gonna talk about more about what we're trying to do to actually uh, mitigate remote health. Hello, oh, wow. that, that, that is such a big, a big issue for us here in small town uh, or small town Alabama. There are six, first of all, there's 66 counties in the state of Alabama. And of the 67 counties uh, in the state of Alabama, Perry County was the 66th county to have its first confirmed case of COVID-19. Wow. No, all probabilities, not because it didn't really exist, but there was no testing sites. There was mm -hmm. no testing being done in this county. Now that we do have a confirmed case, it, it is not just about COVID-19, but we do not have a hospital within a 30 mile radius. Uh, in January, we lost one of our students, an outstanding young man, 14 years of old, 14 years of age to asthma. And in 2020, someone dies of an asthma attack. His parents called the ambulatory service here. They were on a run in another part of the county so they basically tried to provide, uh, provide assistance to her son and then drive, put him in the car and drive him for 30 minutes to try to get him help. We lost a young man. So in the 21st century, again, this should not be happening. Um, so in regards to telemedicine, uh, we do have doctors that do telemedicine. And basically, for, unfortunately for some of our, our people, that is the only way for our, for our younger people, I should say, that they, they're getting assistance. But then for the older ones who do not have access to the internet or don't even think about it, they're losing out because even in, in a time such as this, who are sheltered in place and they really can't get out or people can't get out to get them, they're suffering in their homes. And, and we're aware of that. So, you know, again, we're not looking at use, losing a generation of young people, but we're looking at losing our elderly generation also because they do not have access to those things that could help with just even small health problems. Yeah. Commissioner, you want to comment on what, what's happening around the telehealth initiative? 
Yeah, um, let me um, make a point here, which is that Congress, during the last coronavirus stimulus bill, gave the FCC $200 million and said, quick, come up with some efforts to enhance telemedicine during this crisis. And at lightning speed, the agency turned around and said, tell us how we can help with remote monitoring and telehealth during this crisis. And by the way, it's not just for patients with COVID-19. Exactly. It's for patients who might be in a rural area who might have to drive in for a regular test of their diabetes or for to um, a pregnancy checkup. They might be able to do these kind of things remotely and in the process, not expose themselves to this virus. And so the good news about this is that we moved this out as a bureaucracy with a speed I haven't seen before. Ever, right. I think the, and I think the other really good thing is that the agency has committed to having grants of a million dollars, no more than a million dollars. But what that means is we're gonna be able to offer these funds to lots of different places in the country. And I hope we don't just offer them, I hope we learn from them. Because if we learn that telemedicine works for certain types of ailments and works for certain types of folks in different parts of the country and that it offers opportunities in rural America that might be unique where hospitals are closing, let's figure out how when we get to the other side of this crisis, we're gonna to continue to do those very same things going forward. And Commissioner, I wanna to touch upon what Dr. Trimble said though, for the older Americans, the problem may be actually a device or even having a simple smartphone. Tell us a little bit more about Lifeline and why that also ties into this conversation on the digital divide. Yeah, the Lifeline program, for those who may not be familiar with it, dates back to 1985. And that was when, you know, you had the phone in the wall and there was a curly cord. I still have to explain to some young people in my office how you untwist those things. In any event, uh, life skills. Uh, 1985, so uh, President Reagan was in the White House and the assumption was across the board was, hey, if you don't have phone connection, you're not gonna be able to keep up with healthcare, get a job, interact with government services or your kid's school. So we were gonna support low-income households to make sure everyone had basic telephone service. Okay, it's 2020. And you know what? Today, that basic dial tone is internet access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got to figure out how to migrate the Lifeline program from being just about voice connectivity to being about internet access. Mm -hmm. And so I think in this crisis, we have to figure out how to come up with some emergency broadband service where we help support that kind of access. Because it's become apparent that if you want to have some semblance of modern life right now, you're gonna need that access. And the Lifeline program needs to be modernized, adjusted and right-sized in order to support that access for low-income folks. And that's not just folks with kids in school at home, it's also for senior citizens. And today about 2 million senior citizens rely on that program, about a million veterans rely on that program, but we could do so much more if we made it meet this moment and making it meet this moment involves rethinking how it can help with internet access. Yeah, before I go to you, Dr. Trimble, I wanna encourage people who have questions in about less than 10, 15 minutes, I'm actually going to go to Twitter and to email and get your questions so that we may respond. If you have a question, send it to events at brookings.edu or send it via Twitter at brookings.gov or digital divide, hashtag digital divide. I'm seeing on my own Twitter right now, a lot of questions coming in, a lot of activity. Keep that going. I think what you're hearing from both of these ladies is that we need to keep making noise. We need the noise. We need the noise. I mean, Dr. Trimble, I want to go back to you. Now, I put out in this op-ed recently that we need to park a big school bus that could actually broadcast Wi-Fi in neighborhoods where we know kids do not have access. I have to tell you, it may have sounded like the magic school bus when we were growing up, but it seems like the most creative solution that we have right now to get young people online in addition to checking out these Wi-Fi hotspots. Going back to these young people, even going back to the uh, challenges associated with getting telehealth services, what do you think about that? Is that a feasible idea to do what, whatever it takes to make sure people are connected? Well, when we, when we had a district meeting immediately after our preemptive closing, uh, that was one of the first things that we discussed, getting hotspots on the school buses, mm -hmm. placing them in, and that is something that our, our superintendent is pushing 
um, profusely at this point, getting hot spots. The problem that he's having is going back to like the commissioner was saying, uh, he can't find hot spots. First of all, right now, everybody's trying to get hot spots. So um, that's one of the things that we're looking at. And then, Nicole, if you remember the ice cream shop that was here and all of the young people were, well, guess what? It's closed down. So, I mean, so now you, you have places where our, our young people would gather and, and have access. So that's becoming less and less within our, our little small town because, it, it, and I don't mean it's closed down because of COVID-19, it's closed down. You know, it closed down prior to this. So we're having that issue, but that's one of the things that the superintendent is working hard on right now. And I've been working hard with them to try to find hot spots. So if somebody can help us out with some hot spots to go on some school buses, we got the yellow cheese wagons. We're just, we're just waiting for some hot spots to get on it. Okay, so put, your, put yourself to the camera because a whole lot of people look at you and say, I need my hot spots. We <laughs> need hot spots like <laughs> yesterday. Like okay. yesterday. Our superintendent, and that's one of the things when the superintendent was talking about it, you know, I'm one of those go-getters and he was looking at me and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna help you out with that. So uh, I've been uh, really, really, cause he was like, I've tried and I just cannot. And I was like, okay, fine, I'm on it. So yes, not knowing I was gonna be doing this. So yes, please listen, we do need hot spots in Perry County. You know, and this is interesting ladies and um, I'm gonna start throwing these questions out to both of you and then we'll go to questions. I mean, this is a new normal. I mean, if you think about it, we don't know how long we're gonna be in this state. Uh, we're not sure. Uh, if we'll ever return back to a place where we were just, you know, two months ago, the extent to which now schools and uh, our workplaces and our hospitals have to rethink the methodologies in which they actually provision services um, and deliver those services will probably be different. You know, one question to you, uh, Commissioner, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this, um, with all this increased usage of broadband, um, how are we doing in terms of our network capacity? And, um, you know, we've had tons of private sector investment in these networks, but are we going to make it? Because I think this new normal is going to be a lot like the information superhighway is going to be the defining factor in terms of its strength and ability. Yeah, that's a really good question. Because like I said at the start, we're online like never before for work, for school, for entertainment, for healthcare, all of it. We're putting stress on our nation's networks like never before. And I think the FCC should be monitoring this. We should learn from this stress. What are we gonna need going forward to make sure our networks are resilient and can withstand this load? What does it mean when we're not just consuming content online, but we're in conversations like this, we're in video chats, we're uploading data constantly, we're creating too. That means traditionally, we've thought about having higher download speeds than upload speeds. But maybe we need to revisit that and think about more symmetrical networks. Because again, we're not just consuming online, we're creating online now. So the FCC, if we've got a major weather event, a hurricane or a power outage, daily produces reports that says, here's how our networks are faring. Here's the cell sites that are down. Here's the outages we see. I think the agency needs to do that right here and right now. Lots of companies are producing reports and that's useful. But the agency needs to have a standard methodology so we all know how our networks are faring, not just nationwide, but in the communities where we live because that's what matters to us most. Right, and what has this plan, um, Commissioner, that I'll go to Dr. Trimble for the last word here before we go into question and answers. I mean, what has this experience taught us? I mean, I've been in this space for 25 years. Uh, one as a digital activist, now as a scholar who's writing about this. And I continue to see the same kind of conversations happen over and over again, and it scares me because this uh, exit from analog into digital is actually going to matter. It's gonna determine our life choices, our quality of life. It's gonna determine a lot of factors, our, our health and well-being. So if we were to put on a post-COVID hat and begin to forecast into the future, what would be your counsel uh, going forward when we eventually come out of this? And then I'll switch over to Dr. Trimble. Well, I think as you know from your research and as Dr. Trimble knows from her experience in Alabama, these problems have existed for a long time. This disaster is just exposing them to more people. So what we need to do is take this crisis, take this momentum, like you said, make some noise, raise a ruckus and decide we're going to fix it. I think this is an inflection point for action and we've just got to seize it. We need to connect everyone in this country just as we did with rural electrification 
and plumbing and every age, major type of infrastructure that came before. We need to start thinking about broadband in that same way. And we need to start thinking about access to it as a right. It's no longer a luxury. This crisis has made that clear. Everyone's going to need access and we got to find a way to make that happen. Yeah. And Dr. Trimble, I would say to you, I mean, I've been on the phone, you wouldn't believe it. I'm not an educator, I'm a child of educator with a whole lot of school districts who are just scrambling to figure out how to promote these programs. I give it a big shout out to schools and I give a big shout out to libraries who have really made the decision to do the morally right thing, which is to not disadvantage just one or two or hundreds of students if they can't get everybody online. In your experience and in your wise counsel, what would be your uh, advice to school districts that are really trying to get their hands around this homework gap, as well as figure out how to take the remainder of the school year and make it productive? Uh, first of all, I think the first priority is to bridge the gap between the local, the state, and the national entities mm -hmm. with educational personnel and elected officials to hear the concerns uh, and to find solutions, to combine assets and with needs. Understanding that if you want productive citizens in a digital age, the digital needs must be provided. It has also forced us to look at digital inclusion as a school. As you know, there are some people who embrace technology and some do not. All of our teachers are, are required to use digital platforms now. Uh, within the last two weeks, some have actually had to have tutorials or, or many lessons on how to be fully inclusive to be the best of their students or for their students doing their uh, remote learning. Uh, just Monday when I was at school, one of the teachers said, with all this technology um, we're learning and that we're using, we're going to be way ahead of the game when we start back in the fall. And I was saying, baby, you never get way ahead of the game in the digital world. Uh, we have to continue to go digitally and hope everybody around us provide those avenues we need in order to do so. As the commissioner said, no one in the educational community should be viewing internet access as a luxury. It has to be, to be perceived as a dire need. So first, we must change the mindset of everyone within our educational communities to understand that access to the internet is not about, pre, about, about prestige. It's about empowering our students for not only the future, but also for the present. Because technology is not just a passing fad. It is here to stay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've got a lot of questions. Um, you know, I think we covered a really good ground. I mean, the first thing that we covered is we do have this homework gap that we have to close. I think we also covered some policies that we need to pay attention to and add areas for further legislation. I think we covered the fact that there should be more public-private sector partnerships. And I think we went to the root of the problem, which are people. <laughs> At the end of the day, all this affects people, right? We can talk policy all we want, but without the, the, the most important P of people, we would not be sitting here today um, having this conversation. So we've got a lot of questions. That's what I'm over here trying to figure it out, what to do. And um, I'm gonna try to do this the best that I can and get to as many questions as possible. Um, and I'll try to pivot it to each of you to take on a question. And then if you want to come in and add, please do. But you know what I forgot to talk about, uh, Commissioner's 5G. I don't know why I forgot to talk about 5G, because I talk about 5G in every other sentence in terms of what the possibility of it is to actually close parts of the digital divide. I'd love to start with a question from the audience, which is uh, around 5G technology and you know, how you think 5G could have potentially impact the digital divide that we're talking about today? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 5G for the uninitiated is the next wireless standard. It will have radically higher gigabit speeds and much lower latency, which is going to make available a whole range of new applications. Um, it could be transformative, much like 4G, the last wireless standard was transformative because it put a smartphone in all of our pockets and palms with lots of applications. This would be connecting lots more in the world around us so we could be more efficient, more effective, and more safe. But again, we've got to be on guard for equity in deployment, just like with every other network technology. And early deployments in the United States of 5G have focused on really high band airwaves. And that spectrum has a lot of capacity, but the signals don't travel very far. So as a result, those early deployments have largely taken place in our most urban centers. The accounting and math works better there. That makes sense. But over time, we're going to have to figure out how that technology is just not limited 
to wealthy urban centers. We got to figure out how we use other spectrum bands and change policies to make sure that it reaches more people in more places. So those innovations are not just limited to our urban corridors, but can reach everyone. Okay, now Dr. Trimble, I have a, a question for you. How can schools collaborate with regards to the education gap and closing the educational gap, particularly with early childhood education institutions at this time where we're sort of in this uh, disparate um, system? Is there any collaboration that can happen between schools to close some of the educational gaps? Oh, absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, although we don't, we only have two schools within our district. Uh, one of the things that that have uh, helped us tremendously is is the collaboration between the schools because everyone don't have the same thing. Everyone don't have the same. Everyone do not have the same professional learning that they have received to even know how they can maximize the use of, of what they do have. So the collaboration, and especially with us being a uh, connected at school, we have been able to collaborate with other schools to let them know what means that they actually have, even though they may not know it. So yes, okay. that is very, very important and can help so many other places. And, and like I said, I've been one that's been doing that, so that's not a problem. Yeah, no, I, I know, look, I, Dr. Trimble didn't share, but her school has actually consolidated K through 12 schools. Yes. And if you want to really get into the weeds on her school, again, go to the Brookings webpage and pull the paper on uh, bridging the digital divide between schools and communities. And you'll find out that she has had to bridge early education with high school transition. And she's been able to do that with this aspiration of giving all of her kids technology. Um, Commissioner, this question is for you. Over the last few years, we've seen many state governments uh, funding rural broadband programs. As state budgets are disseminated by COVID-19, these funds are likely to disappear. What are federal agencies like the FCC doing to bridge the gap in the short term? Um, and so we'd love to pick this up, um, question up with you. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think to date, Washington has not worked well enough with our state counterparts on these initiatives. And I think that if we figure out how to row together, we're gonna get there further. And we're gonna use all of our scarce dollars in a smarter way. I know that there are about 30 states that have their own broadband programs and some of them are big, some of them are small. I think it is now incumbent on Washington and the FCC to do a much better job coordinating with those programs because we wanna take our scarce resources, make sure they go further. And also because in the end, we're not gonna figure this all out sitting here in Washington. We're gonna need people on the ground in the states who know where service is and is not to help us with this process. So I think going forward, we are gonna to need to coordinate like we haven't before. Shame on us for not doing it in the past, but in the future, we have really gotta make sure we do that because I think it's gonna make the difference between getting service to more people and waiting longer for that to happen. Thank you. Dr. Trimble, I got a question for you. How can public libraries work with community partners to help implement some scalable solutions around digital equity? Have you thought about the role of the public library or have they come to the table to talk about ways to bridge this gap? They actually have. Uh, a lot of our students actually have to rely on the public library because they don't have access at home. So we do sit at the table with the public library. Uh, unfortunately, like at this time, it is closed like everything else. So that doesn't help in a situation like this. But as the commissioner said, it, it is bringing light to it, to how we have to work even more so in terms of collaboration, going back to the initial question that was asked, because we can't, we can't do, we can't have one without the other. We, we have to work together in a sense. So yes, the, the public libraries have helped us tremendously. We have students who have online classes and unfortunately, when we were on the grant, they could take their devices home and do the work. Now they can't. So they have to set aside time to go to the public libraries and do that. Mm -hmm. I just, so, I just want to, yeah, let me just jump in on that because that E-rate program I described that's been around since 1996, which helps wire our nation's classrooms, also yeah. helps wire our nation's public libraries. Yeah. So schools and libraries have been in this cooperative partnership for more than two decades through the E-rate program. Mm -hmm. And some of our libraries are just doing amazing revolutionary stuff to get everyone connected. We have big libraries like in New York and Kansas City that are loaning out wireless hotspots to help patrons. We've got little libraries in Maine and lots of other places that are doing it. I spent some time on a library in New Mexico on, a, on tribal lands, and they were trying to figure out how to make sure people had more access after hours. And their solution was really kind of low tech. They just built a bigger porch and made it comfortable for more people to sit outside. Mm -hmm. 
And I love the creativity of that solution. I love that it's probably low cost, but I want us to do more dramatic things. And I'm pretty convinced that libraries who have been partners with schools and helping with the homework gap are really gonna be there going forward after we go through this patch where so many of them have had to shut their doors and close to their patrons. And I have a question on, um, hold on, this whole question of libraries, because libraries also help us a lot with digital literacy. And so we've spoken a lot about access to the internet. And this is actually a question from uh, one of the listeners for both of you. When we think about digital literacy, what should we be doing to get people up to speed on all of these things that we're talking about? I know there's been some schools that I spoke to and some partner organizations that are afraid to give the devices because they're not sure that people will know what to do with them um, or won't know how to use them or be safe. So digital literacy, talk to us a little bit about um, what that means for you, Commissioner, and then uh, Dr. Trimble, what that means for your community. You wanna okay. go first? All right, yeah. sure. Um, so uh, the FCC doesn't have a direct assigned role in this, but I can tell you two things that have become apparent to me as I've traveled around the country and talked to schools and libraries about this. With schools, when it comes to the students, our kids today are digital natives. They've got a facility with figuring it out that it probably exceeds that of many of their teachers, definitely. In my own household, I can tell you it even exceeds the parents, right? They're, li they're, they're growing up in a world where there's no distinction between the analog and digital. And I think that that has enormous impact on their willingness to participate in digital education and their effectiveness in doing so. Now, when it comes to digital literacy, I do think a lot of our nation's libraries have been doing enormous good setting up programs and assisting communities with making sure more people can get online. I've seen some incredible programs, for instance, at public libraries in places like Brooklyn where so many people speak so many different languages and they're figuring out how to draw them all in and make sure they learn. So those individuals can be more effective in their communities and are more likely to choose to be connected at home. And there's so much good that libraries are doing in this regard. And I think, again, when we move through this pandemic and we come out on the other side, I hope that they'll continue doing that. It's been so important. And Dr. Trimble, what about you? How are you uh, encountering digital literacy among your parents and, and, and students? And what are you trying to do around that? Uh, one of the things that this, this has done, uh, I think our, our parents have been more reluctant about uh, using um, digital tools. And they look at this, they have been looking at the children like as if, okay, well, this is your thing to do to keep you busy. But now with uh, this pandemic, it is forcing them to take a look at what their children are doing. And they're able to see, they're able to learn a lot from their children. Because uh, one of the things that we do is we've worked on part of digital literacy is being a good digital citizen. And so as a result of that, they're able to show their parents, and their parents are able to see that it's not just about me playing games, it's not just about me interacting and communicating with my family and friends. This is actually a tool that is empowering me. And as a result of it empowering the students, it is also empowering their parents, which in terms of it is empowering our community, which is what we want, which would give us a voice and a reason to sit at the table to have this conversation. Because now I realize the effectiveness and the importance of this tool. Now let's see what we can do about getting. Yeah, I mean, and that's one of the things, right? Our parents, and I, and I when, when I came to Marion, you told me one of the things that you put together was a parent computing center. And those parents that I ran into, they were like, no, 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 my kid is not going to know more than I do, right? I'm going to figure this out. Okay. And honestly, people who are listening, I mean, this digital divide is really about the invisibility of a whole lot of people who are not necessarily grasping the skills that they need to actually get online. Mm -hmm. And and some of that is going to be intuitive. They're going to have to figure it out, just like we're figuring out these mitigation strategies. I think at the end of the day, we're going to have to figure out a way to sort of codify this, right, so we can move forward. Um, I got a question about my bus. <laughs> so I want to ask uh, the commissioner. I am so, my kids think I am actually not getting any sleep because I keep seeing this bus in lots of places. Um, we've seen this Wi-Fi enabled bus in uh, Florence, uh, South Carolina, throughout South Carolina. They deploy 3,000 buses, I think with a partnership with Charter Communications to provide the open hotspots. Um, we're seeing in South Bend, Indiana, um, where there are buses that are actually deployed. Commissioner, can we get Wi-Fi enabled buses through E-Braid or is this going to be something that's more of a Herculean effort to actually bring that? Because one of the questions was, why can't we do this and why can't we do it nationwide? Yeah, listen, as far as I'm concerned, let's do it. Let's do it right now. You know, I first visited one of these school buses 
several years ago in Coachella Valley, California. Oh, and everyone thinks Coachella, they're thinking some big musical festival. Yep. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the agrarian community that's in Southern California with a lot of folks who work on farms. Mm -hmm. And the superintendent who used to work there, uh, someone named Dr. Daryl Adams, yep. he managed much like Dr. Trimble to get devices to every student. But then what he found was when he shut the school at night, the kids were still hanging around the parking lot. They were sitting down with those devices because it was the only place they could get online. So he came up with an idea that's really smart and has started to flow around the country. And it's especially potent in rural areas because kids in rural areas spend a lot of time on a school bus. It can be an hour going to school and an hour going back. Yes. So he turned that ride time into connected time for homework. And here's the thing, what if we were able to do that nationwide? So many students, especially in rural areas, would be able to go to school and back, download homework, get their math sets, quickly watch some videos about how they're supposed to manage in pre-algebra pre or whatever they're studying. It could be really impactful. And there are folks that are doing this in Alabama, in Indiana, in California, in Illinois, all across this country. So I think that the FCC should step up, use its E-rate program to support these initiatives. And to that end, there's bipartisan legislation in the Senate, and there's also legislation in the House to suggest the FCC do just that. And I am certainly gonna keep on pressuring my colleagues that we can do that because I'd like to imagine a point in the not too distant future where kids again could ride that school bus and get to school and back, and that we could turn that ride time into work time. So any child who needs it will be able to get some connectivity during the course of that ride. Yeah. Dr. Trimble, um, sort of the same question because I know you're all for getting a Wi-Fi school bus. You've already put out the plea. When you think about these partnerships that you've had over the past, and I want you to think bigger than Mary, Mary in um, Alabama, uh, companies are doing a lot of stuff. The Internet Essentials program from Comcast, T-Mobile just announced programs. We're actually tracking a lot of those programs here at Brookings just to sort of see what we actually have available to people. Question I have for you, what incentives can you actually offer to those companies to, to want to come into communities like Marion and, and sort of partner with you? Or do you just need plain old information to actually make that happen? What do you need? Um, actually, one of the, like I said, one of the, one of the problems we have, we have a lot of them that have have offered, but because of the the lack of broadband connectivity, has been a problem. But I'll tell you one thing: I promise you this: um, if we can get it and get it in those students' hands, you're going to see some outstanding, productive citizens. I'm going to tell you something: all of the the challenges and the obstacles that we've had and we still do have, I never utilize them as an excuse, and I don't let the students utilize it as an excuse either. Even though they don't have a lot of the resources, they don't have the textbooks, they don't have internet access and they go home now. Still, the last couple of years, we've still graduated 100% of our students. 100% of our seniors still got into college. So I'm gonna tell you something. If anybody ever make an investment in this community, I promise you they'll get some positive return from some outstanding young people that leave that high school. Yeah. Now we're running out of time, but I do have to ask this on behalf of folks that, uh, I mean, there's just so many questions, I don't even know what to do, but this is what I feel, <laughs> really hard pressed to ask before we close up. Our friends of Native American tribal lands, um, our friends in urban communities, we've talked a lot about rural, but they have the same problems when it comes to digital access. Commissioner, in terms of what are we doing for during COVID, post COVID, to ensure that our tribal uh, reservations are actually connected for one, and then two, what do we need to do more of in the urban space just to make sure they have, I think you've also mentioned lifeline, but is there anything else we need to do? This is a yeah, all, in, um, all hands on deck problem that we have. <laughs> all right. Um, first, let's talk about tribal lands. Listen, Native Americans shouldn't be the last Americans to get connected, but many of our tribal lands are among the least connected places in this country. We don't want them to become digital deserts. We're going to have to figure out how to use the E-rate program to get their schools and libraries connected. We are have to get their healthcare centers connected, and then we got to work on getting folks connected at home. In the near term, the FCC has some opportunities for tribes to engage in their own connectivity projects using the 2.5 gigahertz band that are really important. And anyone who's interested in tribal connectivity, I would definitely encourage them to seek those out. That's a fantastic opportunity to help create more wireless networks in tribal communities. 
And like you mentioned, urban areas, I think a lot of our digital divide conversation has ignored the realities of urban areas. Lots of kids are not connected and can't do their schoolwork in urban America. And if they used to be able to rely on a fast food restaurant, a coffee shop, right, or a library, that. they can't right now. And so we are exposing the extent of the digital divide in urban America in this crisis. And those kids, just like their rural counterparts, are missing out. We gotta make sure that when we think about a national policy to close the digital divide, we think about urban, rural, and everything in between. That's right. So ladies, we are out of time. I could sit here with you forever. I could sit with this audience who has been very engaged um, over live stream. Uh, this is my first moderated conversation. So I think I did well because my boss took a picture of us. <laughs> he was able to capture a good, a good pose. But what I want to say to all of you that are listening, first, I want to say thank you to uh, FCC Commissioner Jessica, Jessica Rosa Warso. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Kathy Trimble. The uh, benefit of having them both at different places and having this conversation is just invaluable. And I want to just alert all of you, continue to follow us at brookings.gov. We will keep looking at these issues and pushing solutions. And again, uh, look at my expert page for some recent work that's come out and look for the book that will be out in 2021. Keep this top of mind. Keep <laughs> this top of mind. The digital divide was there before and it's not going away. So this is a great opportunity to have some collaborative discussions so we never come back and have the same type of conversations. Thank you, everybody. Please stay safe. And we're all in this together as we get through COVID-19. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate thank you. Thank you guys so thank much you. for having me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. If you can stay on for just a thank moment, you. wrap up. And we will look at all your questions. And as much as we can, it'll be in one of our documents at Brookings in our research. So thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.